What do you want? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if you'll gather around, come on in. We're going to kick things off in just a moment with uh, three shanties that we have used to do work on board Ernestina II. We are the beans. So, for raising sail, Bony was a warrior. Away, a warrior, the terrier. John France. Bony fought the Russians. Away, the Russians and Prussians. John France. Bony brought the boys from France Away, to teach the Russians how to dance. John France. Moscow was a blazing. Away, Bony was a raging. John France. Bony went to Waterloo. Away, it's the Harry got his overthrow. John Bony went away and died away, hey, away yeah. in St. Helena. John Francois. Hey, Bonnie Bunch of Roses, oh, Bonnie Bunch of Roses, oh, Go down, ya blood red roses, go down. It's time for us to roll and go. Go down, ya blood red roses, go down. Oh, you pinks and poses, go down, you blood red roses, go down. We're bound out to be Kiki Bay, go down, you blood red roses, go down. We're bound away at the break of day, go down, you blood red roses, go down. Oh, you pinks and poses. Go down, you blood red roses. Go down. Oh, rock and shaker is the cry. Go down, you blood red roses. Go down. The bloody top mass shave is dry. Go down, you blood red roses. Go down. Oh, you pinks and poses. Go down, you blood red roses. Go down. Just one more pull and that'll do. Go down, you blood red roses. Go down. With a buckle's for a kick a through. Go down, you blood red roses. Go down. Oh, you pinks and poses. Go down, you blood red roses. Go down. Running down the Oops, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Running down to Cuba for a load of sugar. Way me boys to Cuba. Make a run, you lime juice squeezers. Running down to Cuba. Way me boys to Cuba. Make a run, you lime juice squeezers. Running down to Cuba. Oh, running down to Cuba with the press of sail. Way me boys to Cuba. Slaking the water all over the rail. Running down to Cuba. Way me boys to Cuba. Slinging the water all over the rail. Running down to Cuba. I got a gal, she's nine feet tall. Way me boys to Cuba. Sleeps in the kitchen with her feet in the hall. Running down to Cuba. Way me boys to Cuba. Sleeps in the kitchen with her feet in the hall. Running down to Cuba. Oh, load the sugar and the homeward go. Way me boys to Cuba. Mr. Mady told me so. Running down to Cuba. Way me boys to Cuba. Mr. Mady told me so. Running down to Cuba. Thank you. So three rather short shanties. Um, the first um, we used on Ernestina, usually raising the jumbo. Didn't take long, actually. Probably sang two verses too many on that one, because um, that sail goes up pretty quick. Um, the second, Blood Red Roses, we may have used with several others putting up the mainsail, because that took forever to put up. Um, and running down to Cuba, we actually used with the windlass, raising anchor. Um, and it became the favorite of uh, one group of teenagers um, when I was on board. Whenever we had that task, we were out, we were out for a week. Um, 
I'm Jim Bean, this is my wife Cindy, and my best friend Steve Solwald. Um, we've been singing together for a long time. We've been volunteering for the schooner Ernestina for 20 years now. Um, thank you. Thank you. That's right. Um, so we, we started off um, in 1992 when Tom Gu, of, uh, presently of the um, Sea Shanty Chorus, invited us to do a fundraiser, but soon we were on board uh, working and volunteering. Cindy and I have been sailors for many years, um, and so it was always an absolute pleasure uh, getting on board to, to sing. Cindy and I actually met singing, we met Steve singing, it's just one of the things that we love to do. And on board the vessel, um, we got to try out actually making the songs do the work, because the songs uh, are what, they coordinate the labor, they coordinate the effort, so everybody's pulling together. Because um, when you're trying to raise the mainsail, which does weigh as much as an SUV, um, you better pull together, or it's trouble. So, um, very quickly, for anybody who is not familiar with Ernestina, um, you'll hear much more of her history a little bit later, but in her time, uh, since she was built in Essex, Massachusetts in 1894, she has been a Grand Banks fishing schooner, an Arctic explorer, a U.S. Navy vessel during World War II, um, she started off that life as the F.E.M. Morrissey, but after World War II, she was bought by Captain Mendez of Cape Verde. He rechristened her as Ernestina, named for his daughter, um, and she began making transatlantic passages. Um, she had a short stint as a school bus between islands. Um, and then finally, she was gifted back to the citizens of the U.S., and particularly to the state of Massachusetts by the people of Cape Verde. If you are a citizen of the state of Massachusetts, she is your boat. Um, which, uh, with, a, with a history like that, there is really no other vessel afloat right now that has a history like that. There is the Constitution in Boston, um, which has a longer history, but for that incredible variety, nothing can match Ernestina, and she should be better known than she is, and that's part of what we're trying to do today. Um, very quickly, um, during our, our experiences aboard her, we were certainly on board as shantymen, as singers. Um, I also had great pleasure being out on board for um, week-long cruises with groups of young people, um, and as well as day sails, where I would spell one of the regular members of the crew um, I actually even got a weekend of cooking. I can tell you if the regular cook had not prepared everything else ahead of time, they would have starved because it was on a one burner diesel stove. Um, and it took forever to get stuff ready. But um, one of my jobs ashore is I'm a, I'm a music teacher, but I'm also um, an outdoor education challenge course instructor. Um, ropes courses, as they often get called. And some of the experiences on board Ernestina are very similar, where young people who may not quite believe that they have the capability that they have push their edge a little bit, meet the challenge. Um, several times while we were out with a group of, of usually underprivileged teenagers, um, we would teach them the sailing skills all week long. And on the last day, when we knew that they had what they needed, they might not have known, Whoever was at the wheel stepped away and said, oh, you know, there's Boston, you've got a tanker there. And the kids would take two minutes to figure out who really learned which lesson, put that person in charge of that job, and they inevitably took her there. It was an incredible uh, self-affirming experience. So um, we're going to sing a couple more songs. Um, and these, um, the first two, are going to relate back to her, her fishing career. Um, so we're going to start with a song, actually, which comes from England, but we certainly sang this uh, on board it often enough. And I need to grab a chair here, Steve. Grab a chair. Grab a chair. You can't grab a chair? No, I just need to put my knee up for me. Okay. Okay. Um, back one, one foot. So this has a great chorus. 
says fair isle to labrador bear isle to norway and cold greenland's shore learning my trade with the men of the sea at the age of 15 i stepped out from the harbor the very first trip for the silver fish pond I was Scotty boy, mess man, the lowest of Collins. Last I was off to the troll fishing ground. Bear Isle to Labrador, Bear Isle to Norway, and Paul Greenland shore. Learn to be trade with the man of the sea. Here's the chorus. It'll come back again, so be brave. Long years of a decky, a hole for me living. I danced on the deck midst the wild arctic gales. To the tight grip of fear as the cold sea swept over me. I soon learned the truth of the old trawling tale. Bear Isle to Labrador, Bear Isle to Norway, and cold Greenland shore. And the pocket soon empty If now and pay later There's hard days to come Bear Isle to Labrador Bear Isle to Norway And cold Greenland shore Word in the trade With the men of the sea Now oh, I know it tops the horizon I learned all the tricks of the trawl fishing trade Though the sea has provided the trader and taker I got me mates ticket, my future is made As a skipper at last, a stand call on the dockside The boy to the man, to the master of men Sure, the ocean is mine as we slip from the harbor Back to the sea to start learning again Bear Isle to Labrador, Bear Isle to Norway and cold Greenland shore Learn to be traded with the men Very often as we uh, looked for songs that would speak to the fishing trade, we find things from England or from Canada. Um, I got tired of trying to find one that spoke to me from the U.S. Um, we were on Ernestina one afternoon coming into New Bedford Harbor and there was this big red fishing boat called Let It Ride, the gambling term, you know, leave the bet on the table. Um, so it was a metaphor I couldn't refuse. And so um, I wrote this basically to honor all the fellows who I grew up with in the West End of New Bedford who followed their fathers into the fishing trade. Oh, 
it'll come back. My father was a fisherman, and his before me too. Taught me the trade when I was young, I know nothing else to do. And I bought this boat six years ago, the year the old man died. She's a steel of beauty and an anger, let it ride. Let it ride, let it ride, let it ride. Let it ride. Each trip out's another gamble, but when I earn, I earn with pride. Took my first trip out when I was twelve I was mostly in the way But soon I learned to sort the hall What would and wouldn't they Played poker with the off watch While the others worked top sides Learned that long shots seldom pay Still let it ride Let it ride, let it ride, let it ride Gamble. What I earn, I earn with pride. Though these days the odds get longer with each turning of the tide. Lay it all down on the boat and let it ride. Now with quotas and restrictions, less times catch don't pay. Then the wife keeps saying, cash it in, for the bank takes it all away. But we're ready and provisioned, so we'll head out with the tide. Sure as hell can't fish ashore, so let it ride. Let it ride, let it ride, let it ride. Each trip out's another gamble, but what I earn, I earn with pride. Though these days the odds get longer, with each turning of the tide, lay it all down on the boat and let it ride. Let it ride, let it ride, let it ride. Each trip out's another gamble, but what I earn. Well, a couple of things I should mention in our volunteering now for Ernestina, um, Cindy and I are both members of the, uh, the program committee. We are all members of SEMA, the Schooner Ernestina, the Schooner Effie Morrissey Ernestina, <laughs> however I can get that, which way, frontwards or backwards, um, association. Um, and, and we would encourage you to, to join SEMA um, as one way for keeping Ernestina afloat and eventually sailing again, which is what we, that's, that's our, our biggest desire. Um, we're going to go on here with, with another number. Um, we got, we got six. Um, do, you want to do the sweet rose again first? And then do the set? Yeah. yeah, we can squeeze it in. Um, So we're going to sing um, one song, which is simply another great fishing chorus. Uh, it is, it is a shanty, but we don't sort of sing it in shanty It has about six words in it, so you'll figure it out. <laughs> Thank you. 
So the song is Sweet Rosie Ann. in a song um, about one of New England's more storied captains, Captain Zebulon Tilton of uh, Martha's Vineyard, who sailed another famous schooner, the Alice Wentworth, um, uh, around these waters right up until World War II. He was sailing without an engine um, and delivering goods doing so. Um, but uh, we want to sing this one partly because the Alice is no longer out there. She's on the bottom. Um, and we just want to encourage everybody to help the Ernestina so she won't be on the to, bottom uh, too. to yes. avoid that fate. Yes. And we'd like to thank the Harwich Historical Society for having us and Jill Mason for the local access channel for filming us. Um, and for everybody that's done anything to help the Ernestina and for anybody that will help the Ernestina with anything they give. This is by Larry Kaplan, a pediatrician model. I'm not tired of the wind, I'm not weary of the sea, but I guess they've had a belly full of a dando coot like me. I'm going to show she's bound for better days. I'll see her topsails flying 
When I come down off a ways A rosy get my Sunday shoes Dirty get my walking cane wheel Take another walk to see Old Alice sail again Well I wish I had a nickel for the men I used to know Who could load three cord of lumber In a half an hour or so Who could put up sail by a haul Instead a donkey in the rock Might be the poorest coaster man This side of a good town A rosy get my Sunday shoes Dirty get my walking cane wheel Take another walk to see Old Alice sail again Any fool can run an engine It takes brains to work a sail Never see no steamer Make much good out of a gale You can go and pay taxes with the ration gas you get but at least to me the wind is free and we haven't run out yet our roads get my sunday shoes dirty get my walking cane wheel take another walk to see old alice sail again if I ever get back to her, you know I'll treat her just the same. Jive her when I want to, sail in the freezing rain. Park the old deer on the beach, go dancing in the town. Cause a man who's fit for hanging probably never will get drowned. Rosie, get my Sunday shoes. Dirty, get my walking cane wheel. Take another walk to see old Alice sail again. Ah, Rosie, get my Sunday shoes. Dirty, get my walking cane wheel. Take another walk to see old Alice sail again. Thank you very much. Thank you. I know we are going to hear so much more from the Sea Shanty Chorus. Instrumental. <laughs> the Appalachian Mountains. Um, awesome. I don't think everybody, anybody ever took it to see. You years never ago. know. <laughs> In, um, if, I'm, if my memory serves me right, in 1998, Ernestina flew her, uh, her top sails for the first time since the 19-teens. Um, and I had the great fortune to be on board that day, and I actually had bow watch, which meant I got to walk out on the end of the bowsprit and look up at the full press of sails and go. And so, um, this one's not on. So, I think actually it works pretty well. Can you hear the bells coming from there? Yes. Or should we like it? Yes, we can hear it. Wonderful. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. So, um, the song has the following chorus that came to me on the bow sprit. Um, Power and grace in a following sea. See her rise and roll so fine and free. The whistling wind makes the rigging sing. Tell me, have you seen her? The grand old lady of the fishing fleet, she charted the Arctic waters deep and was the immigrant's way to America, lovely Ernestina. Um, tell me, have you seen her? And lovely Ernestina, which only rhymes in New England, uh, come back in every verse, so please do. <laughs> Power and grace in a following sea, feel your rise and roll so fine and free. The whistling wind makes the rigging sing. 
Tell me, have you seen her? The grand old lady of the fishing fleet. She charted the Arctic waters deep. Was the immigrant's way to America. Love me, Ernestina. I saw her there at a new Bedford dock This big black bully boat all the top No, just one look and my heart was caught Tell me, have you seen her? She's no man's yacht, she's a working boat A piece of history still afloat And she's known all along this Atlantic coast She's lonely and Christina Power and grace in a following sea Till her eyes and rolls of fine and free The whistling wind makes the rain sing Tell me, have you seen her? The grand old lady of the fishing fleet She charted the Arctic waters deep Was the immigrant's way to America Now all my days I've been a singer of songs Telling tales of the times that are passing on But the past is present as we sail along Tell me, have you seen her? We sing at the halyards for throat and peak We sing to the windless clank and creak Or to warm the heart when the weather's bleak Sing along the earth is Power and grace in the following sea Feel her rise and roll so high and free The whistling wind makes the rigging sing Tell me, have you seen her? The grand old lady of the fishing fleet She charted the Arctic waters deep Was the immigrant's way to America This walks through to its end. Tell me, have you seen her? Flying ship and jumbo, forceful and main. The sing for the hauling and for even the chain. But sometimes I sing just to praise her name. Lonely Ernestina. Power and grace in the following sea. Feel her rise and rolls of fire and free. The whistle and wind makes the rain. The grand old lady of the fishing fleet She charted the Arctic waters deep Was the immigrant's way to America Lovely Ernestina Lovely Ernestina Thank you, thank you very much Please help keep your clothing, get her sailing Barbara Berga, who's done so much to put this together today and many other programs as well. Thank you so much, Cindy. Um, the, 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 the grounds here, as many of you know, have been um, well received by so many artists, so many talented folks, singing and, and otherwise artists, for many, many years. What many folks don't know is, um, I've said that my grandmother was born here in Howitch. My mother was here in Howitch. Um, I grew up in Taunton. However, what I'd like to say about this wonderful place is the first time I came and sat under these tents was probably back in 1995 or 96. And I came to hear the singer and storyteller, Joel I. Gonsos, who we have lost a few years back. I was so enamored with Joel I this place 
these wonderful folks who wanted to learn so much more about us that it prompted me to continue with this collaboration, with this love for Howard, Ernestina, to go back to Cape Verde. And here we find this exhibit this year is based partly because of our wonderful love and collaboration, but many, many of the artifacts and items that I, we have in there, I have been gifted from the family of Jolai. He, of course, was a former chairman, and we, we honored him for all the many things he did. Wrote the Liberian National Anthem, sang with Harry Belafonte. Laura can tell you so much more Many folks, like Jenna has mentioned, about her son, Paul Pina. Born and brought up here, but many times we need to go away from home for folks back home to remember us. So with that, I wanted the lovely Ernestina to play before the lovely Dr. Laura Pires Hester, our commissioner for the schooner Ernestina this year, comes and tells us more about her love and life trying to get Ernestina back sailing again. Laura, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Can all of you hear me? Yes. Do so I need to put the mic? Okay. Um, I'm so happy that, first of all, another round of applause for the Bean. And I don't know if you've got that, but Jim Bean did compose that song. I think he made that clear. And the um, the Ernestina has spy inspired not only lovely Ernestina, but a lot of other poetry and song. And if you know about anything about Cape Verdeans and Cape Verdean Americans, you know that music is with us wherever, right? Uh, we have music and food wherever we are, whether it's a happy occasion, and or sad and, and milestone type of occasions. I know that Vasco Pyers was also going to be with us this afternoon, but I want to read a poem in his book, Soul and Spirit, Discovering Our Roots in Cape Verde. My sister and brother have just read it, and they're enamored of it. Um, and he finally, he was on the Ernestina, and he says, Ernestina, I sail on you at last. Your history is part of my past. You carried my ancestors across seas so vast, human cargo carried from shore to shore. In calm seas and storm after storm, you carried them without harm. Sa sa sailing silently up Vineyard Sound, Tarpaulin Cove la lies off the port beam. Music fills the scene. People conversing with sea chants filling the air. Moving along in wind so fair, wind fills sails to get us there. Four sails drive you when the wind is blowing. One iron jib keeps us going when the wind is slowing. <laughs> Ernestina, how graceful you are. A lasting gift from a proud nation Cape Bird, you will always be my inspiration. And of course, this was written after the Ernestina was made a gift to the people of the United States in 1977. So, thank you again, Jim Bean. Thank you, Bosco. And there were many songs that were attributed to, and those of you who know Cape Verdean music know that the sea is a very big theme of Cape Verdean music. And there's a wonderful song which I've just heard on the Cesaria Eborda. How many of you know Cesaria Eborda? Yes. She's kind of the goodwill ambassador from Cape Verde. Unfortunately, she just died last December at just 70 years old. But she's known as the International Barefoot Contessa of Jazz. And she sang of the people and of a lot of songs about the sea. And one of her songs is called Mar e Morada de Sodiat, which means the sea is home to Sodad. Sodad is a very favorite 
Cape Verdean word meaning love, nostalgia, longing, etc. And so many of the songs speak about people leaving, people coming back, and the separation of people. I was born in Wareham, Massachusetts. I live in New York now and have for the last, let me tell you, over 40 years. Um, and my father, I was born here, of course, my father came over in a schooner similar to the Ernestina in the early 1900s. It's either the Diane or the, or the uh, Romance, and I'm trying to confirm that. But he came over as a young man, and this song that Cesaria sings tells of her walking on the beach in Nantasket. Is there a Nantasket? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. I was trying to figure out, and I was asking my brother exactly yes. where it is. But she had been, several people had been here, that she was walking at night, not at night time, but you know, the at dusk, which is a very, to me, is a very nice time. When the sun is going down, Sol Tacamba, she was walking on the beach in Nantasket and remembering her walking on the beach in Furna Brava, Sanda na Praia di Furna Brava. And when I heard that, I was thinking, when my father came over as a young person, he, we're from Brava, and Furna, I had been to when I went in 1981 for the first time, I just thought that even he might not have walked on the beach in that casket, but I'm sure many times he had that feeling of remembering the time when he would walk on the beach of Purna, which was a port that many of the old vessels went back and forth. So, okay, a brief overview of the history, and you got some of it from uh, Jim in, uh, when he was talking about the Ernestina. The Ernestina was born as the F.E.M. Morrissey, which was the name of the daughter of William Morrissey. Uh, he, as Jim said, it was, it was built and launched in, in Essex and, and Gloucester for William Morrissey and a friend. So they owned it until 1914, and it was used for fishing, coming from Gloucester, to Grand Banks, to uh, Newfoundland. Newfoundland, not Newfoundland, as most of us say, uh, fishing for cod and bringing back to Gloucester. Of course, that was sold across the world. In 1914, Harold, Harold Bartlett, a cousin of Bob Bartlett, who was born in Brigus, Newfoundland, uh, bought the ship. And there were a few years there when the ship wasn't used, but it was also continuing to do fishing. And during that time, Bob Bartlett became the famous ice captain. He had gone, he had been Admiral Peary's right-hander, right-hand man when Admiral Peary went up to the North Pole in 1909. And as the story goes, by the way, some of you may not know this part of the story, um, he did, he wanted to claim the discovery of the North Pole for himself, you know, Robert Peary, uh, which is understandable. So he said to, they took him to a certain point and Bob Bartlett stayed behind while he made the, the rest of the miles up to the North Pole. Well, the other part of the story that doesn't get told very often is that there was an African-American man, Matthew Henson, who did go up with him to the North Pole. You don't hear about him so much. Uh, and a couple of years ago, in a Time magazine, there was a little article about either his great-granddaughter or a niece, Matthew Henson's descendant, who wanted to do something to recognize Matthew Henson. And I'm not sure that she ever did. But that's a, a part of the whole lore of, of that part of the era. So, uh, Bob Bartlett, during that time, had become known as this famous ice captain. He was very, he came from uh, ancestors who were also ruddy, seagoing types. I just read a book where, in fact, as a child, he was a very sickly child. He was very weak, he didn't like to eat a lot, 
and his parents wondered, what are we going to do with this child? He obviously can't go to the seed like we all have. And then they thought he might go into the ministry. But at one point his father said, okay, you're going to come with me. And something happened to him. Barbara says, when you step on the Ernestina, something happens to you. Something happened to Bob Barton, if it wasn't the, the Effie Morrissey, that he started to eat, become strong, and they said, okay, maybe he's going to be a seaman after all. So he really wanted to go make an Arctic trip himself. So in 1924, he bought the Ernestina from his, his uh, cousin, Harold Barton. And he started these trips that for the next 20 years also brought young boys. Uh, Jim was talking about what going on these day trips or week-long trips with young, uh, younger people, how it teaches. You have to work together when you're on the sea, otherwise you won't get very far or something else more dreadful happens. So he, he believed that the young boys 14, 15, 16 years old, needed to get their hands dirty and their minds cleaned up. So taking them to sea was a good way to do this. So in 19, he would take boys whose parents paid $2,000. Wow. And, and, yeah. and a fortune that time. So they were wealthy, pretty wealthy parents and families would take these boys on this trip up to the Arctic. In 1940, we actually had a couple of people who were very active in the campaign to restore Ernestina. Uh, Fred Littleton, whose name you might know, he was the harbor master at Falmouth or Hyannis? Chilmark. He also died a few years ago. In, in fact, recently, one of his grandchildren had a wedding on the Ernestina in New Bedford. Uh, so they've been continuing to be interested in the vessel itself. And also Austin Colgate, as a 14-year-old, he was very active in the campaign to restore Ernestina. He has also died. We have to thank all of these people who were so instrumental in, and in, including all the people who have worked on the Ernestina's volunteers and, and um, uh, from the Sea Shanty Forest. So he made all of these trips, and, and again, he became more and more famous. He was very interested not only in, the, in being a sea person, a seaman, and the Arctic, but he was also very interested in the social and human aspects. When, when he became very friendly with a number of Eskimos over the years, and he also thought that these were many people whose stories should be told. So he, he always had, these trips had to be supported. So the National Geographic, individuals, foundations, the Smithsonian, a lot of other organizations would fund these expeditions. He not only brought back live animals for the zoo, for Bronx Zoo, for the Philadelphia Zoo, other zoos, and also specimens that would go to the Museum of Natural History and the Smithsonian, etc. So he had a, he was a very intriguing person because he wasn't just exploiting everywhere he went, but he was very interested in, they learned all about the plant life in World War II. Again, as Jim said, the ship was used as a World War II reconnaissance uh, flight, a supply ship. Uh, and helping to, to chart air currents that was very useful. It was a commission by the Navy to do all of this. So, in 46, he died of pneumonia in New York. And the ship in 47 was, there was, like other schooners and other vessels from the late 19th century, a number of these vessels were given up because they were too old. Their owners, and mostly the Yankee owners, would say, you know, we can't use them anymore. So they were kind of given up, and Cape Verdeans, like Captain Henrique Mendes, would purchase these vessels. So in 47, uh, it nearly, well, it did sink, I should say it did sink, not nearly sank, it sank in Flushing, 
uh, Basin in New York, backtrack a little, it was sold in the interim to two brothers, Jackson brothers, who outfitted her as a cruise ship, painted her white with all the amenities, wanting to take her to Tahiti. Ernestina, in the words of the Bartlett friends, committed suicide. <laughs> there was a mysterious fire in the galley, and she sank. And her friends said she refused to be a cruise ship. She was not a leisure ship, she was a working ship. And that's what we're committed to. She needs to sail, she needs to work, because she has a lot more to do in her life. And she's now 118 years old. So, Captain Henrik Mendes of Cape Verde had had already 30 such ships, had made about 50 transatlantic voyages already, had lost uh, two or three of them because there were uh, hurricanes and, and other conditions in the Atlantic which sometimes they could not, you know, they could not avoid such tragedies. So he bought the ship. Actually, his daughter-in-law bought the ship for him because she knew that he wanted the ship. And he said, this was the best ship I ever bought. So between 40 a Okay. <laughs> the traffic. You're competing with the traffic. traffic. Okay. okay. I can't compete with traffic. Can you hear it? Is it on? Not on. Is it on? Hello? No. So from that time, that the first voyage was in 48 over to Cape Verde. And you can imagine, and in the port of Furna Brava, this white, beautifully painted <laughs> schooner, 150, 150 spar length, but 155 spar length, appearing in the port, and people coming down, and there was all kind of celebration, just in the same way when she came to Providence or to New Bedford, everybody would go down, they would have music and celebration, getting things from Cape Verde, sending things back on trips. So he made about a dozen trips back and forth, up until. Uh, 65. During that time, he was also making trips. The Ernestine was also making trips between the islands and Dakar, most often taking students, but also taking like a piano to a church or other uh, uh, goods, presents for families, etc. Until she was doing this inter island until 1974, when by that time, of course, there were steamships that were making the trip over to Cape Verde in, you know, seven days, so there wasn't much uh, demand for this kind of sail back and forth. So in the late 60s, there were people from the F.E.M. Morrissey part of the history and the Ernestina part of the history who were interested in finding where the ship was. I gather that the Effie Morrissey interested people really didn't know where she was and finally discovered that it was one and the same as the Ernestina and she was over in Cape Verde. So as you may know, how many of you know where Cape Verde is? I'll do now. <laughs> everybody, everybody, okay. So in, as you know, in Cape Verde, the independence happened in uh, July of 1975. So there was a group of people interested in the, where the Ernestina was who wrote a letter to the president, President Aristide Pereira, and asked him if the Ernestina could come to participate in 1976 tall ships up up the Hudson River. It would be the only ship from within the African hemisphere to participate in op sale. And he agreed. So in June, they set sail out of Mindelo, which is one of the northernmost islands uh, in Cape Verde. And unfortunately, it was dismasted by a hurricane. So the mast, they had to set, you know, the, the mast had to be set into the sea, and she was towed back to Mindelo by a, a sister ship, the Wilma, uh, which is one of those ships that was used in the transatlantic uh, packet trade, it was called. So that 
energize a Friends, National Friends of the Ernestina slash Morrissey uh, committee to begin to try to raise money to have her restored and renovated, rehabilitated. In 1978, this new government made the momentous decision, that's an amazing decision, to make the Ernestina a gift to the people of the United States. To recognize the long-standing connection between Cape Verde and U.S. This connection goes back at least three centuries. And to also recognize and acknowledge this long tradition of Cape Verdean entrepreneurs who had purchased these old vessels and made them useful for this transatlantic this transatlantic voyage, people and cargoes. It also is itself a unique gift because as you as you hear about this wonderful diverse history, it's like no other. There is no other ship like the Ernestina. So Cape Verde itself put in probably close to $2 million investment in the repair and renovation of the ship. And on this side, we tried to raise money. Uh, groups were organized in Wareham, in Bedford, in Providence, in New York, in Philadelphia to raise money, local Ernestina groups. We finally brought the ship over not we, I wasn't on that voyage. <laughs> Norm Gomes was on that voyage in 1982, <clears throat> August of 1982. We had six U.S. people, seamen, sea, sea persons on the vessel. One of them was a woman, a licensed captain, I say that all the time, a licensed captain from New York who had her own <coughs> sloop and she came over as a regular able-bodied seaman. One person was the radio operator, one person was the medic. Uh, we had an arrangement to have contact with the Ernestino on the, on the voyage, three o'clock every afternoon, patching through uh, a ham radio. A friend of ours, Joe Rose in Wareham, uh, with the ship, with Lisbon, Every day, we wanted to make sure where the Ernestina was. And Norm, who's now a licensed captain, is going to tell you, I hope, about that, about that sail. It was become, the Ernestina was become close to 15 days, 10 to 15 days around the Bermuda area. And a very interesting thing happened during that time, very scary. Uh, when, and I think Norm took pictures. But it came under sail because we had gotten Cummins engine to donate a, uh, an engine that was built specifically for the Ernestina, but we couldn't figure out how to get her there. So the engine was sitting on the Gloucester dock all that time, and they came over, it took 41 days to come over, including those days of become. Now during her, her times back and forth, the trip could have taken anywhere from uh, 26 to 48 days. And a couple of those had those days of being become on the Atlantic. A note about the number of people, and I, and I see in the song it says the only way for them to come over, and I know this metaphorical, because there were probably at least 200 of these other ships that go back to 1870 or so that were purchased by Cape Verdeans making these uh, back and forth trips. The Ernestina herself probably bought, brought um, maybe 50 to 60 passengers herself. And the other ships brought more people. However, she represents that long tradition of sailing back and forth and that long tradition of these ships that were purchased by Cape Verdeans. So during that time, we, we raised funds, we sent money over there, we had a Dutch shipwright whose baby was born on the Ernestina during that time. 
I went in 1981 for the first time. I had never seen the Ernestina before. I heard about her coming when she came a couple times to New Bedford, and I heard about when she came to Providence, and I knew that that was always a wonderful celebrate, celebratory time. But I had never seen her. When I saw her and stepped on her in Cape Verde, in the Port of Mandelo, it was really, really something. And I looked forward to when she would, should be returning. She arrived back in 82. She had to be certified by the Coast Guard, which she was in 1987. So between 1987 and 2004, she sailed on the East Coast, up and down, up to Brigus, Newfoundland twice, uh, to the St. Lawrence Seaway. She went up to Mi Michigan for the Governor's Conference. Uh, she did a lot of, of training and, and uh, giving these experiences to adults. My brother, who is a, a retired merchant mariner, his uh, the, the club, the Exxon Club, or the Merchant Mariners Club, would book her for a day sail, uh, and they'd bring the musicians along, as well as Cape Verdean food, etc. We need to get her back to Salem. We need to get her back to be able to do that. The last time she actually was a full program was in 2004 with the ECHO program, and Barbara Burgo was a very important part of that, where they worked with many uh, CBOs and other organizations. They served about 6,000 6, young people, had interns. 20,000 people sailed that year. Teachers. That year, right. So and that every year that could happen because there, it was easier to raise money for programs than it was for deferred maintenance. So the Coast Guard would not certify, recertify her in 2005 because of the need for deferred maintenance. In 2009, we had a 1.1 million restoration of the front half, <laughs> which is technically the, the bow, the bow mm -hmm. of the ship. And if you were to go into Bedford, you could see the difference. You see the difference between what the deck looks like and what the, the, the uh, stern part looks like. DCR was, for the last several years, the state agency that we relate to uh, in the early 90s was the Department of Environmental Management and before that it related directly to the to the governor's office. Um, DCR in 2009 also cut the staff. So we didn't have any more program staff except the carpenter. We've had not so much uh, many programs during the summer. This summer Elizabeth Labor Casurgis has been a wonderful program coordinator for Elizabeth yeah. and her husband. Come on, husband. <laughs> because his was Sir Lever Surge. Sorry. <laughs> Elizabeth <laughs> Labor is what's on my phone. Uh, <laughs> but she has done a terrific job in outreach and bringing out people and children. And anybody who walks by going yeah. to the curry curry hunt ferry, she makes sure she grabs them either going or coming. <laughs> and tells them about the great, this wonderful ship. And we're very grateful to her because last summer, for example, we had no programs. And you know, just in the same way that the ship has to work to be kept alive, we also need to do programming to keep her in the public eye, to, to build that visibility and support. So thank you to Barbara for organizing not only the, the uh, exhibit inside, but also this Ernestina Day. Thank you, Jane, to the Brooks Academy Museum, and to Elizabeth and all the volunteers. Thank you. The volunteers have been the backbone, as they are with any of these ships, I'm learning more and more, of our ability to, to keep Ernestina along. Can I say a couple words? Just a couple. Please. Please do. <laughs> and the connection from your family, your in-laws. Um, by the way, I dragged my family here. Um, Marilyn McClellan to service right here in the front row. I'm embarrassed to my husband, Mike. Um, and if you have a chance, I know a lot of you are involved with the Ernestina anyway, but for anybody who isn't, 
we have a whole lot of pictures on the Cape Verdean connection, as well as the whole history of the Ernestina spread around here. I know you guys don't want to color, so you can skip that table if you want. <laughs> but if you don't, there's sparkles too. But Elizabeth, <laughs> yeah. please tell it. Chuck, a smiler, I, several people this past couple of weeks have volunteered and you had students like C Lab tell us a couple of and a, just um, a snippet of what maybe one of the children might have said or two of the children about. Well, there were there are a couple kids who are on here. Um, one of the things that Barbara's probably referring to is uh, she was talking about how one of the kids she had said it hasn't sailed since 2004, and they said, "Oh, that's when I was born." So <laughs> these were kids who didn't know anything about the ship who were from New Bedford had never been down to the water, so they didn't know anything about the history of the ship, even though it was actually in that town. So it's been very rewarding to have the kids come here, learn the connection, do mechanical advantage and things on board the ship. So even though it isn't sailing, it's important that they have hands-on. They can learn how to tie knots there. They can learn about it. We had basically the ship divided up into sections, and a lot of the people here I dragged into helping uh, but on the bow learning about how the people the crew lived in the forecastle, in the fish hold how it at one time was room for a lot of cod and then later on was transferred into more passenger area and in the back where the captains always had a little more space than anybody else but I welcome anybody to come down. The boat is going to be open for the working waterfront, and even though I am not there, a lot of these people that you see around will be, and take a look at all of the stuff that I brought along. And who? The, September. The, water, the working waterfront is the last weekend in September. Where? In, and it's on uh, State Pier in New Bedford, and all you have to do is go on schoonerernestina.com or dot .org, sorry. Or you could just Google Working Waterfront. And who was your who was your assistant this summer? <laughs> that young man that worked oh, with you. Yes, I had um, as a summer intern. It was wonderful. The great grandson of Micah Mendez no. uh, uh, came there as an intern. He, I think, was probably dragged there by his father. He wasn't. <laughs> particularly enthusiastic and didn't really know a lot about the history but actually learned a lot from the various people on the ship helping out and by the end of the program he was actually running education stations on his own and when I initially announced to people that his great-grandfather was Captain Mendez he was extremely embarrassed by the end he was telling them before as they stepped on the boat, so, <laughs> so it was very nice for him to have this personal yeah. connection. So great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. We're so grateful. Well, Elizabeth, I just want to say I'll pass this around if anybody's interested in on this table here are albums that I made up of the whole campaigns going back to 1976 through the 80s. So you're welcome uh, to look at those and. Thank you so much for being here.